Uh, my name is Jason Abraham and I'm one of the owners of Hupe and Abraham. How many people have seen my commercials with William Shatner? Okay, good. Um, I'm a personal injury lawyer, so I represent injured people. I don't do anything else other than that. I have 11 offices in three states and I employ 190 people. And all we do all day long is represent injured people. For me to become a lawyer, the one thing you have to do is you have to obviously get your high school uh, diploma, then you go to law school. It doesn't matter what you major in, uh, it matters what grades you get, and then you take another standardized test like you guys took today. It's called an LSAT test. And then the law schools look at your grades and your LSAT test, and then they determine whether you are the type of candidate they want to go to uh, your law school or their law school. And then if you get accepted into law school, it's a three-year program. And then after that, you have a law degree. Um, I knew right away when I was young I wanted to be a lawyer only because my grandfather and my father were both lawyers. They don't do what I did, uh, but I was lucky enough to just say I wanted to be a lawyer. I really didn't know what it meant. They just were lawyers. And so it was easy for me to say I want to be a lawyer without really knowing uh, what it meant. Uh, one of the most important things you can do when trying to determine uh, how to be successful in your own career is if you want someone in my last group wanted to be an engineer, another one to be a veterinarian, I would encourage all of you, even before you go to college, to talk to someone that's in that field to figure out what's important and, and why is that critical, even at a young age after you're a senior in high school. Uh, because for me, one of the things I found out, and not through my family members, was when I go to undergraduate, it's not important what I major in, it's imp really important the grade point average. A lot of people that are lawyers think it's important they major in political science or something that criminal justice or something that has a legal undertone to it. And what I was told right away, and it was really good advice, was none of that matters. What matters is your grade point average and your LSAT test. So what I did was I picked psychology as an undergraduate major at Madison uh, because I was interested in it. And if we're interested in it, we're probably going to do better than if we're not interested. So I knew right away that that was something that would differentiate me maybe from someone else that picked something else that they didn't love, they may not have done as well, and, and ultimately it wouldn't matter. It didn't matter what I majored in, it major, mattered the grade point average. So it's really important at a young age to try to figure out, if you know, a lot of people don't even know what the heck they want to do, and that's good, that's okay too. You know, you can figure that out when you're in college. But if you really do know and you have a passion, meet at a young age uh, with somebody in the field so you can get that leg up. And then another couple of pieces of advice I think that are important to know is, um, first of all, there's a lot of luck and timing in success. I'm humble enough to say uh, that although I'm uh, one of the owners of the Midwest's biggest personal injury firm, uh, I couldn't get there without all the people that I've employed throughout the last 22 years I've done this and without a lot of luck and timing. But then you have to parlay that luck and timing with a hell of a lot of hard work. No one gets anything easy. Uh, nothing good comes easy and you really don't appreciate it unless you really work hard. So be prepared in whatever field you have uh, to work hard and put that effort in and realize and be humble enough to know that it takes a lot of luck and timing also to be successful. The other piece of advice I give every young lawyer that works for me is you don't get successful by worrying about what anyone else does uh, that's ahead of you. Uh, at a young age when I started it with Mike Hupe 22 years ago, I understood that there were five lawyers that were ahead of me. I was the youngest one when I was hired. I was a year out of law school. I didn't worry about what any of the other lawyers did. If they did something good, I was always happy for them. I didn't waste five seconds on hoping that someone else didn't uh, do something good because then I felt that I could step up and, and take their place or jump ahead of them. I didn't waste ever in my lifetime any energy on hoping someone else did poorly. Those people very rarely become successful. And if you waste 10% of your time or 15% of your time worrying about what someone else is doing, that 10 or 15% you could have spent uh, on your own success and working to make yourself an indispensable member of the firm. So although I started at the youngest, I really made myself an indispensable member of the firm by doing whatever it took to be successful. And I made Mike have to make me a partner and an owner. And as a result of that, I, I, he was compelled because I was doing everything that needed to be done and he didn't want to lose me. So <coughs> hopefully you get some luck and timing and then uh, parlay that with a lot of hard work. And then hopefully one day you'll be standing here like me talking to young people and, and hoping you make a difference.
Uh, unfortunately, now there are a lot of lawyers looking for work because unfortunately law schools are graduating a, a lot of uh, lawyers and there are enough jobs for the lawyers that are coming out. The New York Times last year did an article and it said um, we would advise against going to law school because it doesn't pay. It's too expensive and there are not enough jobs. So unfortunately right now I could hire as many lawyers as I wanted all day long at around $50,000 a year, which really is not that much money for what it took to get there. Uh, I have eight or nine law students that I employ right now. Two or three of them have already graduated and can't find jobs and, are, and they can stay with me as long as they want, but you know they don't have a job. Um, the most lucrative area of law to practice in is what I do. And, and why is that? It's because I don't do anything hourly. Most lawyers bill by the hour. If you need a will done or you have a contract that you need drawn up, you go to a lawyer and the lawyer tells you it's going to cost you $150 an hour and the lawyer does the work and you pay him for however many hours he puts in. Well, you can imagine, I don't care if you charge $1,000 an hour, you can only work 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. You're capped. I work on what's called a contingency fee. Contingency fee means I only get paid if I win. I take all the risk. So if you're involved in a serious accident and you hire me, you don't pay me a nickel unless I win for you. And then I get a third or 40% of whatever I get for you plus my expenses. So my hourly, it doesn't matter how many hours I work, I get a third or 40% of whatever I do. So there are times I settle a case for two or three million dollars and I may only put five hours of work into it. Well then I get a third, I, if, if I settle a case for three million dollars, I made a million dollars and I put five or 10 hours of work into it. Now that doesn't happen all the time, but there are times that does happen. There are times I settle a case for 25,000 or I try a case and I get 25,000 and I put in 500 hours and then I make very little. But the key is if you can do what I do and do it successfully, there's a lot of money to be made because you're not capped on anything. You get a third of whatever you collect. In the last 22 years now, I've collected myself personally over $300 million for injured people. Um, so you can see when you, you know, divide that by three or 40%, that's a lot of money. So there are a lot of lawyers that don't make a lot of money and there are a few lawyers that make a lot of money. So it all depends on number one, how much effort you put in, how good you are, Timing, luck, a lot of that. Yeah? You said a third or 40%. Right. Is that determined? It, it's determined is? on uh, the kind of case we're working on, for example. On all automobile accident cases or slip and falls, our fee is a third. On nursing home litigation or some products liability cases or medical malpractice cases, we may charge 40% based on if it goes up on appeal, you have a trial, or certain other things. But I'd say 92% of what we do is a one-third contingency fee. And then plus our expenses. And why is that important? Because you're going to see here some things I'm working on right now, and you're going to see some really interesting videos. Uh, and I could spend, I tried a case about nine years ago in Chicago for a boy that was burned on one of those Fisher-Price riding car, like Jeeps. You guys all see those. They go about two or three miles an hour. They ride a battery. You see Barbie Jeeps. You see all different kinds. Now they make them in sports cars. Well, I don't have a video on that because one doesn't exist. But uh, this little boy was on one. He was three and a half at the time. And they marketed this, and it said realistic gas cap on the box. Um, and what it was a Jeep. little boy was in a fenced-in backyard. And um, his parents were in getting ready. Uh, they were going to take the whole family on a fishing trip. The battery went dead. The little boy thought he knew how he was going to fix it. Because they put a gas cap on it, he thought he could do what he sees his parents do all the time at the gas station, which was go get the gas can that they use for the lawnmower. This runs on a battery underneath the seat. It has what's called a brush wire motor. I don't know if any of you have seen those. They have copper wires. They're exposed. And so I don't know if you know, what, when, it, when it comes with gas, it isn't the gas that starts on fire and explodes. It's really the fumes. So what happened is this poor little boy took the family gas can, undid the gas cap, obviously it was there just for looks, tried to fill it up with gas, got gas all over himself, all over the car, gas got underneath the seat, the fumes collected, sat down on the, the, the Jeep, pushed down on the gas, these brush wire motors spark, it sparks, fumes go up, he's all in flames, comes running in the house on fire. Um, took me seven years to get the case to trial. And I had over $300,000 of my own money in the case. That had nothing to do with time. That was just to hire experts and do all that stuff.
So you can spend a lot of money on these cases. You have to make sure and understand what you're doing. And it's critical that you hire a good lawyer uh, and not a crappy lawyer. And, and these videos will show why. Because you will lose evidence. If you do not hire a competent lawyer, evidence that can make or break your case will be lost. The difference between a lawyer that knows what they're doing and doesn't makes a huge difference. There's a lot of lawyers that advertise on TV. Some of them are no good. And it would almost be impossible unless you look behind the hype and really research who you're hiring to know the good from the bad. We all in the practice know the good from the bad. Um, but you, it's tough. That's why so many of us are advertising on TV now because we want to try to have the general public stay clear from people that won't do a good job. So let's talk a little bit about this. This is a case, actually, this video I played here last year at this time, and this case is still pending. It's a case that got a lot of publicity around the state, but this was a roller coaster in Mount Olympus. This happened about a year and a half ago, and every amusement park company, if you put yourself out for business and you're providing a service, you have a duty to make sure you're doing it as safe as possible. It is completely ridiculous for a business or a company to charge money to have somebody come and use whatever they're selling or the services they're providing and then not maintain it properly. So my family of four goes to Mount Olympus and rides this uh, roller coaster. It's not a very big roller coaster, she can attest to. It almost seems like a two-story thing. It's not that big. So you can see it has the same kind of lap bar that you'd go to Great America. How many people have been to Great America? Six Flags. How many people rode Raging Bull? Okay, I did. I was scared to death. My daughter made me do it. As you're going down that first drop on Raging Bull, you can only imagine what it would be like if that thing that's holding your body in flops open and you would fall out and, and you would be killed. Now, although this roller coaster isn't as big, they have the same duty to make sure that they're manufacturing and or maintaining this properly. My client gets in this car, this exact car. He's sitting in this seat here. He goes around a corner on the roller coaster. The lap, belt, the lap bar comes up. He falls out, lands head first on the cement two stories down below and suffers a brain injury. Thankfully, he's made a pretty nice recovery. He'll forever have a brain injury, but he's made a much better recovery than he thought he was going to make. This family did a very smart thing. They hired me shortly after the accident. And we were able to hire an expert out of California, probably the United States' foremost expert on roller coaster accidents, this gentleman right here. And so we immediately contact Mount Olympus, and we immediately say, we're coming up, we're testing the car, we're taking the thing apart, we're, we're going to figure out what the hell went wrong here. And this was within weeks of the accident happening. Now, on any big case, a reputable law firm is going to do this right away because you, you want it to be preserved. I, I can almost guarantee you if I didn't do that, within two months, this car would have been gone or it would have been fixed, and I never would have known really what happened. So the fact that we jumped on this right away makes the difference between a case that will never see the light of a courthouse and it will mean millions of dollars to my client versus maybe not even winning the case. Okay, so you're going to see in a second, this expert is here. Now, in the background, you can't see them. The insurance, I have Mount Olympus is there. Their insurance company is there. Uh, the manufacturer is there. Their insurance company representative there. There's lawyers for all these people there. We're there. We're filming all this. We have no idea what we're going to see. What we're hoping we're going to see is that the thing is a piece of garbage and this thing is so obviously broken um, that it opened up when our guy went around. But you never know. And, and more than likely, you don't find what we're going to see here, which is so awesome for our case. Now keep in mind when you see him pulling the first three that's the way it should be for all of them. Yeah. Right now we're in the background going because literally with one finger's worth of pressure, he's able to open that lap up. I mean, you can see what was supposed to happen. Even he is shocked. I mean, he's like, I mean, shocked that this thing just flat out won't lock. We, we still don't know why yet. Now, one of the most important things you can do with this kind of evidence right now is simulate the exact condition that was present at the time my client was ejected. 
you have to simulate it with respect to passengers. Wait. Because in order to get this video in, if you don't do it right, and you get the greatest evidence possible, and they can then argue you didn't do a good job, you're showing the jury something that isn't the same as it was on the day of the incident, then you may not be able to play this gold mine for the jury. So you have to really do your job and do it sophisticated. Okay, so what do we do? We have four dummies that are strapped into the cart that simulate the four people that were in there at the time. What else do you think we have to figure in right now besides these four people? Someone throw out something they think we'd have to think about. The weight. Who's that? What did you say? The weight. There you go. The weight. Everybody weighs different. What if it was two kids, two adults? So you want to simulate the exact condition that was there. Okay, so what we then do is, and you can't see this right now, is we put sandbags in there. We figured out the approximate weight of the four people that were in there. We figured the weight of the four plastic dummies that were bolted in, and then we added sandbags so the weight was almost identical to the weight that was there at the time. Then what we do is we start the roller coaster, and it's anybody's, we have no idea what's going to happen. Anybody's guess. Now you're going to see my client falls out at the next turn, and you're going to see what happens at the next turn. See that? See the whole sandbag fell out. And then you hear the insurance company representatives and lawyers all going, oh. And at that point, we understand this case is never going to see the light of day because there's absolutely no way they're going to be able to fight this case because, I mean, in the middle of the ride, you see that the, uh, the lap restraint immediately opens up. And what that tells you is that had been happening for a long time. And they were just lucky that no one else had fallen out of that before. And I guarantee you that plenty of other people had gone to them and said, hey, this thing opened up when I was on the ride. You know, a lot of times people rest their hands on it, but there's no way that that thing hadn't opened up probably hundreds of times with people on the ride. So we'll go back and I'll let it run through so you can see it. <laughs> this case would ever be tried and the jury sees the sand all over the floor, they can easily just imagine my client's head as he falls down the two stories and right on the floor. I don't show you the video because I'm not going to bore you with, we, we have like three hours worth of videos because then what we did was we took apart the whole mechanism to figure out what went wrong and it was very obvious and easy to see what happened. There's, little, there's a gear in there for that lap restraint and then there's a little piece of metal, what I would call a finger. And so for smaller people, it pushes down and the gear keeps turning until the finger goes in. Depending how big or small you are, there's a lot of different options for that gear. So that finger was so worn down that it just didn't stay in any of the, so it didn't stay in any of the, uh, the gears. So it, it was so obvious that this thing had never been maintained properly, looked at properly, and this was not a question of if this was going to happen, it was just a question of when someone was going to fall out. Um, we were on it right away. We hired the experts. We would have never got this kind of gold mine evidence if we wouldn't have been up there within weeks of the accident. And you can imagine, just imagine if there's no video of this. The difference in the case between this with a video and without a video is huge. One other thing I've done in this case 
is I've sued the manufacturer and I've sued Mount Olympus. Now, Mount Olympus is responsible to maintain the roller coaster. I sued the manufacturer as well. Um, I don't think the manufacturer really holds much responsibility here because obviously this thing is older and it was, main, it was I believe, made properly, but they didn't make sure they were maintaining the fingers properly. Why does someone think I would sue the manufacturer if I don't think they have a big role in, in the case? What advantage would that give me to have the manufacturer in this case? The reason is because I want someone else to point the finger at Mount Olympus with me. It's one thing for me to say, Mount Olympus sucks. It stinks. They didn't maintain this for crap. I mean, this was about as bad as it gets. And as a result, someone landed on their head and now has brain injury. It's another thing if, when the manufacturer, I have something to gain because my client's asking for money. When the manufacturer stands up and says, we tell everybody that buys this roller coaster, you have to look at these, you have to maintain these, you have to constantly be, make sure that these are in good working order, that's a neutral third party to me that's also standing up there and pointing the finger. Very helpful for me to do that. So there's a lot of strategy that goes involved. If I can have somebody else also point the finger with me, it, it's two people. Um, and it doesn't hurt me to have them in. Because I can say to the manufacturer, aren't you supposed to look at this every year? What do you tell your customers? How often do you tell them to maintain it? And they're going to be burying Mount Olympus because they don't want to have to pay. So you can imagine they're going to be doing a lot of the work helping me and for me. Now, I don't want them to do the work for me because I don't trust them, but they're standing there going, yes, yes, to everything I'm saying because they don't want to have to pay any money. So that's why I brought them in. It's not, uncom uh, not uncommon for businesses to make these kind of business decisions, as sad as it sounds, um, where they decide it's cheaper not to do something that we should do and maybe pay somebody than it is to do the right thing. That's why it's important to have people like us out there protecting people, the average person. I work for the average person because corporations make these business decisions all the time. Has anyone ever heard of the Ford Pinto case? Okay, this is a case way before you guys were born, before I ever started practicing law. Ford made this really ugly car called the Pinto. Do you remember the Ford Pinto? Yes. It was a horribly ugly car. And not only was it horribly ugly, it was horribly designed with respect to the gas tank. Are you familiar with, with the facts, somewhat about the facts oh, yeah, of this case? Basically, yeah, yeah. So what happened is they made a gas tank and put it in the back of the car. And the problem was they didn't do good enough engineering. And in a certain amount of rear end collisions, the gas tank would explode. And people would be burned alive inside the car. And Ford became aware of it. And believe it or not, they had their accountants sit down in a room with the executives and they thought this would be a good idea. They were deciding, okay, do we recall every Ford Pinto that's been put out on the market? Or do we not recall them? And we try to figure out what it would cost us if we have to pay the family of the burn victims. Some cases we won't pay. Some people won't sue. Some people won't realize it's a defective gas tank and so nothing will happen. So what they did is they had their accountants, they made this business analysis, and they said, okay, if we recall every Ford Pinto, it's going to cost us X. If we don't recall any of them, we don't tell anybody about it, and we just take our chances with paying people that were burned alive in the car, it'll cost us Y. And they looked and they said, X is greater than Y, so we're not going to recall the cars, and we're just going to let people be burned alive inside the cars. And when one person sued, and they requested all the engineering documentation, believe it or not, that memo was found. It wasn't destroyed. And it went through that whole business analysis, and Ford got absolutely hammered because they made a business analysis that it was okay to kill people rather than recall the car because it would be cheaper for the company. You're seeing that right now quickly, and I want to show you a couple other videos. Quickly with GM. Is anyone familiar with the GM Cobalt cases that are happening right now? What's happened, the GM made a car called, the, it's still being produced, it's called the Cobalt. And when they first came out, they had a defect in their ignition switch. And let's just assume that a piece in the ignition was the size of my fingertip. What happened before the car even came out, when their engineers were driving in their lot, the engineer's knee hit the keychain and key fob, and because that piece in the, in the ignition switch was too small, it actually shut the car off. And they didn't change the design. And so they sold all the cars, and what happened is in a certain amount of people, when they were driving them, when their knee would hit the key fob, it would shut off the car. And what was happening is occasionally around the country this was happening, and people were getting seriously injured or killed. A young lady, and I can't remember what state she was in, that happened to her. She brought the car and they said to her, we know what's wrong. Then they said they fixed it. 
Then she took the car the next week. She was out on the highway. Her knee hit the key fob. The car shut off, went off the road, hit a tree, and killed. Her parents sued GM to try to figure out what happened. They took depositions of all the engineering experts. And they asked the engineering experts, do you know what's wrong with your uh, en um, ignition switch? Uh, no, 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 no big deal, nothing wrong. And then they said, did you make any changes? The, the head engineer, they took his deposition, which is sworn testimony under oath. It's being videotaped like we're videotaping now. And they asked him, did you make any changes to it in future models? No. The lawyers went out and bought an ignition switch for the next model year. They actually x-rayed both switches. What they saw was the piece of metal in the second ignition switch was twice as long as the first. So they went back to the manufacturer of the ignition switch and they got all their information. And what they found were memos from that head engineer that said he knew of no changes or nothing wrong with it. And they found memos from him saying they need to change the ignition switch, they need to make this piece double the length. If they make it double the length, they won't have a problem. And instead of recalling the cars and putting in the new ignition switch, they just changed it on the new cars. And now they've been sued and they're just getting hammered because they lied under oath and didn't come clean uh, with respect to that. This kind of stuff happens all the time. It's why in China, for example, versus here, toys are still made with lead paint in China, although here that doesn't happen because they know it, it can give uh, kids brain damage. So these are the kind of things that happen if lawyers like me aren't willing to take these cases on and take these companies on. You can buy motorcycles two, two different ways. You can buy a motorcycle on two wheels, and that's traditional, or you can buy what's called a trike, which is a three-wheel motorcycle. Well, companies thought of making an aftermarket kit that would turn a two-wheel motorcycle into a trike. And a lot of times when companies try to do this, where they try to do aftermarket things, a lot of times not enough testing goes into the products, and things can go wrong. They marketed this as this is a, a great aftermarket product because you can have the best of both worlds. You can not only have a two-wheel motorcycle sometime, or you can put the simple kit on your motorcycle, and then it can turn into a trike where you then have three wheels, and it's simple, and you can do both, and yada, yada, yada. It's going to be easy, and it's sort of like, I don't know if you recall, State Farm was sued a number of years ago because they would require their auto body shops to put aftermarket parts on cars. And what they found is these aftermarket parks are nowhere near as good as the originals. But they thought they'd save money by putting aftermarket parts on cars that need to be fixed. And they didn't hold up. So here you're going to see, I'm representing this woman. This is on Layton Avenue and I-94 I and Layton Avenue. There's construction. So they ha they're, they're pushing my client into this area that would normally be an emergency lane. You can see these are rumble strips to advise you, hey, you're going off the road where you know you rumble on there, but this is actually a driving lane now. So she, the evidence is she's not speeding, she's not doing anything, she has this trike kit on, and she goes into this area, and there's obviously a malfunction with her trike kit. So what you're gonna see is, you're gonna see her come in this lane, you're gonna all of a sudden see the trike kit malfunction, it starts violently shaking, you're gonna see her motorcycle then crash into the wall, she's then gonna herself careen into here, and she's run over by a semi. Now she's not killed, you're not gonna see anything graphic, I wouldn't show you a graphic video. Believe it or not, she only broke, broke both of her legs and she survived being, when you see this, it's quite amazing. But so you'll see this and then she's hit by a semi and then all the staffs. This is a DOT camera. If I wouldn't have requested this within 30 days, this would have been lost. So the fact that we knew this existed and there was the potential to get this on a DOT camera, if we didn't jump on this right away, this video would have ever, forever been lost. There she is. And then she's run over by that semi. Mm -hmm. Crazy she lived. Isn't that unbelievable? So you can imagine where they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Even though I think I'm a pretty good communicator, I've tried lots of cases. Um, I don't care how good I am in the courtroom. I could never describe that in the way that this video describes it. No matter how good you are, you, you just can't. I mean, the jury is going to watch this, and they're gonna, if, if the evidence comes in like it's go, it is, because experts have looked, she's not speeding, she does nothing wrong, and the next thing you see is this trike kick going crazy, and you see her hit by a semi. I mean, that gives the jury a real flavor for what's going on, way more than I could ever tell, tell them. 
So this is what separates good and great lawyers from average lawyers. You know, lawyers that understand what needs to be done right away to build a case and are willing to spend the money to fund the case. Because if, you, if I didn't get this DOT camp, I mean, think how much the value of this case is just less. Once I send this video to the insurance company, they understand that 12 people sitting on a jury, I mean, they're going to look at this and they're going to be like, wow, something really went wrong here. It, it just means so much. I, I have the state's biggest settlement in a police brutality case. My client uh, was in a booking room, and his si he was arrested because his sister had a no-drinking policy at her house. He'd been drinking, had too much to drink. She was mad. She called the police on him. Uh, the police came and arrested him. He was belligerent. They were mad. They were kind of screwing around with him right off the bat. They had him in handcuffs. He's walking down steps. They'd let the handcuffs go and then grab him, you know, so it would, it would hurt his arms. You know, he had all these bruises and stuff here. So he gets in. He then just gets down the stairs. They act like they accidentally drop him in the mud. So he gets in the police station. He's just really angry. And there's a video in there, in the, in the booking room. There's a video. So my client is belligerent, swearing at the police officers. The police officer is really angry. They tell my client to go up to a desk like this. My client is complying. And the police officer, as he's walking, pushes him. My client turns to look at him. And then the police officer grabs him, throws him headfirst into a tile wall, and uh, breaks his neck. Now, the police don't realize that his neck is broken. My client's saying, I can't move my arms or my legs. Um, he's a paraplegic at that moment. They don't know it. They're making fun of him. They think he's lying. They pick him up and put him in a chair. He falls right out on the ground. He's saying, I can't breathe. They're having all this trouble. So after a few minutes, they realize, ooh, there may really be a problem here. So they call paramedics. The paramedics come in. There's audio, too. The first thing the officer says is, my client's trying to win an Academy Award. And then it ends up, they take him to the hospital, and he needs emergency surgery even to live, and he's a quadriplegic. So I say to the, to the city, is there any videotapes? city responds, there are no videotapes. We contact Eternal Affairs because we, we think there's got to be some internal investigation. We ask them, is there a videotape? And they say, yes, there is. Um, I didn't bring that videotape in because it's fairly violent. Uh, but the videotape shows uh, my client being thrown headfirst into a tile wall and shows all the aftermath. We sue the city. We sue the police officer. The city attorney doesn't show the police officer the video before I question him under oath. <coughs> we ask the officer, what, give us your version of events. He comes up with this elaborate bunch of nonsense about how my guy was throwing a punch and doing all this and doing all that. And then we show him the video and ask where all that is and, and it isn't there. And he's done. You know, his goose is cooked. Right before we're trying the case, um, the police officer, after this happened, uh, supposedly is put in the trunk of a car by a criminal and driven around and seriously hurt and gets the mayor's accommodation. He's got all these serious injuries. And all of a sudden, uh, a female officer comes out, and this made all the news here, and says, you know what, he wasn't injured that way. He was sledding on duty, and he, his sled ran into a tree, and he was seriously injured, and we concocted this whole thing that he was put in the trunk of a car, and he was ultimately fired. And the, the city tried to keep all that out, and the judge said, absolutely not. It shows his character. So once all that was coming in, you know, the case ended up resolving itself for a little over $3 million. The, the, the moral of the story is, you know, these kind of things, you have to be sophisticated. You have to get them. You have to do the legwork. You have to spend the money. Because if you don't, you're not going to get the clients uh, the results that they deserve. And that's why they're hiring you. Well, you win your cases. By, first of all, we try more cases than anyone in the Midwest, and I believe that the reason we have to try less cases now is because insurance companies know we will try cases, and insurance companies know they're pretenders from the ones that are willing to go to the courthouse. And if they know you're willing to take the case the distance, they're going to pay you because they know they're either going to pay you now or they're going to pay you later after they pay all their lawyers to do all this work. So we believe that we get paid more than other law firms that don't try cases. And we're not the only lawyers that try cases in this community. But there are a lot of law firms that are afraid of the courtroom. They don't want to spend the money. They want to do that. Insurance companies know that. And because we try so many cases and have so many cases, we believe we get paid quicker and more money than a lot of other firms that wouldn't do that. And it makes sense. Why would they pay another law firm that won't go to trial the same amount as they'll pay me? They call their bluff.
You know, if they say to me, we're only paying you X, and I say I'm only taking Y or I'm going to try it, and they don't pay me Y, I only have one reputation, so I go right up to the courthouse and try the case. Because you have to remember, in anything you do in life, you have one reputation. Once you tarnish that, it's never the same no matter, no matter what you do. I'm always surrounded by, whether it be lawyer jokes or people that are critical about lawyers, and you see that all the time because people have this misconception that people are getting something for nothing. And there's all this suing and frivolous lawsuits, and insurance companies and big business can spend a lot of money to get people to think that's the case, and that really is not the case. I don't want a frivolous case. I want to waste my money on someone that's making something up. But they, they try to sensationalize that. So does that happen? Sure. Um, and how do I deal with that? You know, I explain stories like this. I talk about Ford Pinto or GM cases. Or they, these companies do things that allow my job to be easier. The McDonald's coffee case. How many people have heard about this woman that supposedly got all this money because she spilled hot coffee on herself? Well, I'm surprised more of you haven't heard about that. Well, that did more to damage what I get for people than any other case because what, the, what they did was they made it seem like some woman, an elderly woman, spilled hot coffee on herself and she got all this money. And the facts were really bad against McDonald's and none of the true facts came out. McDonald's was warned they were serving their coffee hotter than uh, people could consume it. Uh, the National Coffee Institute had sent them a letter. They were settling other cases that were burned, people who were, who were burned. This woman was in the passenger seat, was pulled over. She ended up needing seven sets of surgeries as a result of what happened. She was burned all over her privates and her thighs. It was just absolutely disgusting. There's a video called Hot Coffee, and I encourage any of you to uh, Netflix it. Or uh, it's... You gave me a copy. I did. You, you guys got to watch this. It's amazing. Did you watch it? Yeah. Well, and these guys are in my English 11 class. We'll watch it later in the spring. Watch it. It's amazing to see what really happened. People had the biggest thought this thing was the absolute fraud. And um, I tried the case at the local state fair with all the facts. Still got killed. But if you see this movie Hot Coffee, you'll see how big business is buying Supreme Courts and doing other things. So, you know, people complain about us, but ultimately when something happens, they need us. I had to testify at the legislature about a year ago, uh, and I had one of the legislatures really giving me a hard time and w without the facts. And what I try to do is educate them. And when you educate them, that's all you can do. And uh, you, the, the, the thing, I think the most important thing I can do is take my own profession seriously and do what I can to change that sentiment. That's why we do things like public service campaigns. And one of the things I'm going to show you right now in, in the last three years, in the communities we practice, I've given $500,000 of my own money back in the community to make the community a better place. And one of the things I do is something like this. Hi. My daughter just turned 16 last Wednesday. That's my, that's my daughter. She'll, um, and she passed her driver's test last Wednesday and drove out of the parking lot and it was the most surreal, scary experience of my life watching my daughter like just drive away without me in the car and thinking this is what I do for work all day long, dealing with accidents. But I understand what a huge problem texting and driving is. Um, and I, I'm going to show you one video that has a couple facts. Uh, but Eric, who's back there, one of my employees, uh, who um, used to work for some TV stations and does all our AV and videotaping and video production. Um, we take this kind of stuff very seriously. Obviously, we represent more injured people than anyone in the Midwest, but we try to pre prevent accidents. One of the ways we can make our profession look better is by doing things like this to try to educate people about texting and driving. 350,000 accidents a year from distracted drivers. Over 3,000 people die every year as a result of texting and driving. Um, there's all these horrible facts. So I do don't text and drive. Has anyone seen this a don't text and drive commercial on TV with my daughter and I? Okay, you have? It plays on all the Bucks games, plays in the arena at the Bucks games. It, this is a new one we just did. It's going to be on TV starting this week. Um, but this is the kind of stuff we do to try to make our profession look better. Hi. I'm attorney Jason Abraham of Hupin Abraham, and this is my daughter, Allie. 
We're here to spread awareness of the dangers of texting and driving. If you text and drive, you are 23 times more likely to crash. Looking down at your phone for five seconds is like driving the length of a football field blind. We've developed the Don't Text and Drive campaign to promote safe driving. Go to Hupy.com, take the pledge, and get your free Don't Text and Drive sticker today. Don't be another statistic. Together, we can save lives. So, we do yield to pedestrians, don't text and drive, watch for motorcycles, to try to prevent some of this stuff from happening. I mean, it really is an epidemic. How many of you guys have your license? Not till next year. Nope. What do you say? Not till next year. Not till next year. Okay. Don't text and drive. I mean, it is crazy how many of these things I see. One of the, another thing that I see right now in my profession that's impacting us, and I think it's important to talk to you guys about, is social media. How many people are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat? Okay. If you go back 20 years, I mean, I wouldn't have known what any of this stuff was. I only know about it now because I have a teenage daughter. Um, but once you say something, it's out there. And it affects right now me in cases because I have clients that are injured and then they're posting things on their Facebook or their Instagram that's discoverable by insurance companies. And insurance companies want to pay you as little as possible. So they're going to look for anything they possibly can to discredit you. So if you say you have a bad neck or back injury, and then on your Facebook post you're, paging, you're posting yourself on vacation, you know, mountain climbing where you're using ropes and doing all this heavy lifting stuff, you can imagine where they're not going to want to pay you because they're going to say, well, that's inconsistent. The same thing goes for you guys when it comes to uh, getting ready for college. I heard from the last group that you guys had to write a, a essay on whether you think colleges should be able to look on your Facebook pages. Do you guys have to write about that? Thank you, Mr. Levin. No. Oh, you, <laughs> I thought, it, I mean, really great. Great topic to think about. Now, in the last class, I asked them about the class about that. And I think everybody but one said colleges shouldn't be able to look at their Facebook pages. How many people think colleges should not be able to look at their Facebook? Okay, everybody. everybody. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that uh, because I know as an employer, before I hire anybody, I look at their social media. Why do I do that? Because I take it very seriously that someone after they've been involved in some sort of incident that's impacted their life, has hired me. So I want to know everything I can about the potential person that I'm going to hire. And if I see pictures on their Facebook page of them passed out puking on a Saturday night, um, not that that doesn't mean that they may not be a good employee during the week, but if they're stupid enough to allow me to see that on their Facebook page, then that impacts whether or not I want to hire them because people should keep some of that stuff private. If you don't want colleges or employers to look at that stuff, then you need to keep some of that stuff private. You should know that people are looking, we're looking. You know, before I hire an employee, I'm not me, I have two HR directors, but we're looking at it because it, it can have some very relevant stuff. And once you put stuff out there, you, you can't take it back. It's very difficult to take it back. And when you're your age, and Although I, I just turned 48, it seems like forever ago I was your age. I once was your age, and I thought I was invincible. And you're confronted with things that I wasn't confronted. You guys are confronted with 24-7 socialization. I was confronted with when my parents said, get off the phone. I couldn't talk to anyone anymore. That was it. There was no Internet. There was no Instagram. There was no uh, face, whatever you call it. Uh, when you're Facebook messaging, there was none of that stuff. You guys 24-7 can socialize. I, I've had 20 of my daughter's friends over. I saw you had your phone up. Uh, I had uh, 20 of my daughter's <laughs> friends over, and they're in a group, and they're all together, and they're texting each other. It was, for me, the strangest thing. I mean, you guys were like this far apart instead of you and I talking, hey, how's it going, blah, blah, blah. You know, you're texting each other. I, I mean, I understand that's the way it is now. I, I don't get it. But also keep in mind that you guys are more apt to put something, whether it be a Snapchat, a Facebook, a text message, you're more apt to say something there that you wish you could take back than you are if you and I are talking face to face. It allows you to feel that things are more anonymous. 
you know, people put, whether it be pictures of themselves that they don't think, if you send a picture of yourself to your boyfriend or girlfriend, you don't think anyone else will ever see, you know, keep in mind that stuff is never gone. And these are things that come back to haunt people. And these are things that are out there that employers can see, colleges can see. And I have problems even now with my clients. You know, and, and defense lawyers are looking at this stuff all the time. So I developed this. Hi, I'm attorney Jason Abraham, one of the owners of Hubie and Abraham. I'm here today to talk to you about social media. If you've watched any TV at all, you've heard the age-old Miranda warning. Anything you say can and will be used against you. In today's era of personal injury law, social media ought to have its own Miranda warning because anything an injury victim posts can and will be used against them by the insurance companies. For example, if you're in the middle of a lawsuit and a claim that your quality of life has been compromised by injuries sustained from an accident, don't post on Facebook or compose a tweet that says, great workout at the gym or awesome night dancing with the girls. After seeing such a post, and believe me, it will be seen, the opposing lawyer or adjuster from the insurance company will argue that you can't possibly be in as much pain as you say you are if you're still able to go out and have a good time, work out, or party with your friends. Once the insurance company gets wind that they may be able to use social media against you, they will request your passwords to all your social media accounts. At that point, they will sift through all your personal data in search of evidence that could be used against you. This will be allowed by the courts. In the event that you've already posted something you regret, don't delete it. This could be considered destruction of evidence and also be used against you. If you have posted something you wish you had not, contact your attorney immediately so they can try to rectify the situation and discontinue using social media. And remember, when you're involved in a personal injury case, anything you post can and will be used against you. If you've been injured in an accident, call the professionals, QP and Abraham. You really only have one reputation. And when you're 16, 17, 18, the reputation you want to have is not the same reputation you think about when you're 25, 26, 27, and you're starting your career. Those are two separate and distinct things. But with social media, those things can intertwine now in ways that they never could before when I was younger. So it's just something to think about. I'm passionate about being a lawyer, and more importantly, I'm passionate about helping people and trying to give people good advice at a young age because I really, if I can make an impact on just one person that helps them uh, do something uh, that they're dreaming about or thinking about, that that means a lot to me. Uh, So I love taking time out of my schedule. I was here last year when I was contacted again to come back this year. I said yes in a second uh, because I really enjoy talking to you guys and I'm excited for you guys to follow your dreams. And no dream is too big. I can tell you when I was your age, I dreamed big. In my wildest dreams, it couldn't have been as big as it is for me now. And so dream big, it can never hurt you. So thanks guys.